The violence did not begin on October 7th. On October 6th, Palestinians were living um, a reality where they faced daily structural violence and repression, including the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. Taking center stage today is Omar Shaker, the Israel and Palestine director at Human Rights Watch. He investigates human rights abuses in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza, and has authored several major reports documenting Israeli crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution against millions of Palestinians. In today's episode, he tells us about human rights violations and the war on Gaza and the role of Human Rights Watch in documenting them. Omar Shaker, Israel and Palestine Director at Human Rights Watch, welcome to Center Stage. Thanks for having me. So you worked on the report that labeled Israel as an apartheid uh, state. Shortly after, your work permit uh, was revoked by the Israeli government. Uh, let's go through that experience to explain to the world the apartheid. So you are the Director of Israel and Palestine at Human Rights Watch. Israel revokes your per work permits but you still cannot work in the Palestinian ter uh, territories. That's correct. So my deportation was the product of a years-long effort to muzzle Human Rights Watch and human rights advocates more generally. Uh, even before I entered Israel-Palestine, Human Rights Watch had applied for a permit to hire a foreign employee. Process that's routine. It should take a couple of months. It took seven months, and they denied the organization a permit to work in Israel-Palestine. At the time, they alleged that Human Rights Watch was not a legitimate human rights organization. Once the story went public, they quickly backtracked. The organization got the permit. I got a visa. I entered. The day after I arrived back in 2017, um, an NGO with ties to the Israeli government sued the government, alleging that my entry violated a newly passed law that prohibits the entry of supporters of the boycott, divestment, uh, and sanctions movement that triggered a government investigation and the government then ordered me to be deported in May of 2018. We fought that in the Israeli court system. We actually got an injunction that allowed me to remain until the end of proceedings. We fought it for a year and a half. And in November of 2019, the Israeli government uh, Supreme Court upheld the deportation order and I was forced to leave the country. You're correct. Um, I was forced to leave not only my coverage of Israel proper, but because Israel controls the occupied Palestinian territory, the West Bank and Gaza, it meant in effect, I couldn't continue that part of the work as well. I actually applied for a permit to enter just the West Bank uh, and the Israeli government, late, this is after my deportation, claimed that the anti-boycott law also applied to their rule over the West Bank, even though that's in direct violation of international humanitarian law. And our access to Gaza though has mainly been restricted by the Israeli government. Since 2008, the Israeli government has only allowed the foreign staff of Human Rights Watch into Gaza one time, and that was on an exceptional basis in 2016 before I had joined uh, in this role at least. Um, and so our access has been restricted, and that's primarily the fault of the Israeli government. It's not only against Human Rights Watch. Uh, Israel has um, banned uh, independent investigators for years now. Um, you are deported out of uh, Israel and Palestine. How is Human Rights Watch documenting violations of human rights happening in Palestinian territories and in Israel? And now uh, with under these restrictions and now even further with the war, what, it, what comes with it, airstrikes, cutting off communications, uh, the siege. So let me start by saying what Palestinian human rights defenders are facing is the worst. I mean, the Israeli government has launched an all-out assault on human rights defenders. Israeli human rights defenders are accused of being traitors. There are restrictions on their funding. Um, international human rights advocates have been blocked access, deported, um, faced all sorts of accusations, but Palestinian human rights defenders have had it the worst. They have faced punitive travel bans. They've been arrested. They've been deported. And what we saw happen in 2021 was six of the most prominent, respected human rights groups. I'm talking about groups not only respected in Palestine. These are some of the best human rights organizations in the world. Al-Haq has been around for more than four decades. We're outlawed, um, falsely accused of being terrorist uh, organizations. Their offices were raided, and we've seen them continue to live with that hanging over their head. But in terms of our research and work, we cover 100 countries around the world. Other governments, governments like you know North Korea, Egypt, uh, Iran, have 
Venezuela have blocked our access. So in all of these countries, um, we work in different ways. So in Israel, Palestine, we do have local staff on the ground, Gaza and the West Bank and elsewhere, but we use other methodologies. So with Gaza today, for example, we have a digital investigation lab that verifies photo and video footage based on established methodologies that we use around the world. We also have a team of munitions experts that has experience working on situations of armed conflict around the world. We use satellite imagery. We conduct interviews, which we can do by phone, depending again on internet and phone charging in Gaza today, sometimes even by video. Um, you know, and when we have our staff on the ground, we're able to go interview communities, which we continue to be doing every day in the West Bank and Israel proper. Gaza is more difficult given the current circumstances, but this methodology has allowed us to find you know, war crimes being committed by the Israeli government, by Palestinian armed groups. So our work continues and we're covering it the same way we cover other areas, Syria, et cetera, where we don't have constant access on the ground. The Israeli government not only is committing war crimes against Palestinians, um, they're committing crimes against humanity, including crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. If we want to list uh, those war crimes and those violations of uh, human rights and uh, those crimes against humanity, uh, the list is long. Can you can we state them? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing is to say that obviously the violence did not begin on October 7th. On October 6th, Palestinians were living um, a reality where they faced daily structural violence and repression, including the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. The Palestinians of Gaza have lived under a closure that's unlawful. The moving movement restrictions on people and goods are sweeping. There's a generalized ban on the movement in and out of Gaza. We've described Gaza as an open air prison. Gaza has been occupied for more than half a century. 56 years of an occupation characterized by daily structural violence and oppression, systematic human rights abuses. And the majority of Gaza's population are actually themselves refugees who have been denied for more than 75 years their right under international law to return to the homes that they were expelled from or forced to flee in the events around the establishment um, of Israel proper. Since October 7th, um, we have documented um, a range of war crimes committed by the Israeli government. That includes um, collective punishment. So that's in essence cutting electricity, uh, water, blocking all but a trickle of food, medicine, aid to the entire 2.2 million people of Gaza, half of whom are children. This is textbook collective punishment. It's a war crime. Starvation as a weapon of war is a war crime. Deliberately obstructing the entry of life-saving aid is a war crime. The Israeli government has ordered half the population of Gaza to leave their homes in North Gaza. Now they've started to do it in South Gaza. Um, this risks forcible transfer, which is displacement, which is a war crime. Um, the majority of Gaza's population has been uh, forced to leave their homes. Uh, there's been widespread destruction. More than half the homes in Gaza have been destroyed or damaged. There's been relentless air campaign. Human Rights Watch has documented unlawful airstrikes, and this is not a new phenomenon. We've documented war crimes that go back years, including wiping away entire families uh, with no apparent military target in sight, destroying, reducing to rubble in the context of these hostilities, entire blocks. Previous hostilities, we've documented uh, residential buildings. The, we've documented the use of indiscriminate white phosphorus, which causes lifelong suffering and excruciating burns. So there's quite a long list, the full menu, panoply of mm -hmm. grave crimes and effects being committed. If we add committed. to that the dehumanizing of Palestinians, can we call it a genocide? Look, I think there's no doubt that large-scale atrocity crimes have been committed. Uh, Human Rights Watch has said this from the outset. Uh, I penned a piece, I think, two weeks uh, uh, after uh, the start on October 7th, warning of the rhetoric of the Israeli government that, in essence, was holding the entire civilian population of Gaza responsible for the acts. And I should say again, the acts of October 7th included war crimes. That includes deliberately killing civilians, taking civilians as hostages. Um, but that cannot justify, you know, the, this kind of collective punishment. This is also a question I have. Israel and the world powers supporting, uh, supporting it are justifying the killing of almost now we're at 20,000 uh, Palestinian civilian in Gaza before the 7th of October this year was the deadliest for Palestinians killed by Israel. From a human rights pers uh, perspective, how do we look at the proportionality? 
Look, proportionality is a legal assessment that you don't make of a campaign writ large. You look at it strike by strike. But there are some basic truths that we need to lay out, right? Atrocities committed by one party does not justify committing atrocities against the other party. It's the basic rule. International humanitarian law is not a deal between fighters. It's a deal with humanity. So the people who carried out October 7th, um, they involved the commission of grave crimes. Those people should be held to account for their actions. But what we're seeing in Gaza is not that. We're seeing, frankly, as the Israeli human rights group at Salem has put a policy of revenge, a policy that has sought to hold the entire population of Gaza responsible for those acts. The answer for all grave crimes must be accountability. We're here precisely because of years of impunity for grave abuses, including Israel's apartheid against uh, Palestinians. And we've issued the warning. Other human rights groups have said the same thing, that it is precisely the years of the international community failing to hold the Israeli government in particular, but all perpetrators of grave crimes accountable for their unlawful actions that has led us to this reality, this flagrant disregard for the most basic principles of the international law that grew out of the ashes of World War II. Those are being demolished, literally, in Gaza. When we talk about international humanitarian law, we talk about organizations like yourself, uh, like Human Rights Watch, like ICRC, uh, um, so many organizations that are the ones who are promoting this law. And when people are being killed, they look at these organizations to stand up for them. And there are so many outrage. They, they see that even though you're, um, you're denouncing uh, the violations, you're den denouncing the crimes, you are not calling publicly and strongly for a ceasefire. Why is that? Look, um, the reason why people are calling for a ceasefire is precisely because of the unprecedented scale of devastation and destruction that's taking place. Now, different groups have different mandates. Human Rights Watch around the world, we document the conduct of hostilities and we document war crimes and other abuses and we call for them to end. We've been unequivocal here. Israel's apartheid must be dismantled. Unlawful attacks must end. Aid must be allowed in for the population. We've been unequivocal that apartheid itself, you know, must be fully dismantled. The right of refugees to return to their homes must be honored. Settlements must be dis dismantled. We make those calls precisely because they're rooted in our documentation of abuses and in turn, our calls to end grave abuses of human rights. A call for a ceasefire is a call to make a determination on uh, whether or not hostilities or war continue. Other groups have done so, you know, clearly. But for Human Rights Watch, our, our, our mandate and focus is on ending serious abuse and holding perpetrators to account, including at the International Criminal Court. We've called for an arms embargo. And critically, we've called for states around the world to end all forms of complicity in these grave abuses, including provision of arms, business arrangements that make one complicit in apartheid in war crimes. What about the targeting of journalists? This is the highest rate of killing uh, journalists that ever happened. Uh, it's, it went beyond a uh, record of Vietnam War or World War II. How, how, where is the accountability actually? I am so devastated by the killings of journalists. I mean, these are our uh, folks that we work with, that we know personally. Uh, we documented uh, the uh, deliberate uh, uh, targeting of journalists uh, in Lebanon, where we did a full investigation and showed this was a likely deliberate attack by the Israeli government. It is horrifying. We have not seen journalists killed at this scale, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. And we've been unequivocal and clear, this must end. And those who carried out those killings, uh, those who ordered them, those who pushed the trigger, they must be held to account, including at the International Criminal Court. Ultimately, we're in a situation today where the very basic principles of international law are being flagrantly disregarded. And if the world allows this to continue without consequences, this will affect more, far more than the civilians who live in Israel-Palestine. It'll undermine the protection of civilians everywhere around the world. We have a critical test. Humanity has failed, but it's not over. We still have millions of Palestinians whose lives hang in the balance. We must do more. All of us must do more to end it. Omar Shakir, Director of Human Rights Watch in Israel and Palestine. Thank you very much. Thank you.